We greet you in Jesus' precious name. A very good day to you from uh, my horse Snowy and myself. It's an extremely hot day here on the farm. So we've decided to go into the hay shed and to have a nice chat to you. So please don't uh, be bothered about him. He's also having a bit of a rest out of the sun. And uh, for those that I haven't greeted, I want to say to you, um, this is the day that the Lord has made. So we will rejoice and be glad in it. My dear friend, I want to speak to you about a subject that I speak often about. And that is the power and the integrity and the honesty of the Word of God. You know, why I'm sharing this, and it's right off the cuff, because I've just been watching, uh, I, I try and keep up with the news. I want to know what's happening in the world. I don't want to be like that proverbial ostrich <laughs> with his head always in the sand. I want to know what's happening. Some people say, no, no, you don't have to be concerned about that. I do. I want to know what's happening so I can speak to you from my heart about what I believe God is telling us. See, the Lord says in the last days, He says evil will become more evil and righteous more righteous. The gap is widening. And my dear friend, you might be sitting in your house saying, listen, Angus, I'm not a Christian and I'm not an unbeliever. I'm just somewhere in the middle. You can't be like that anymore. The time is coming when you're going to have to make a decision, where you're going to have to put down your stake and say, this is where I am and this is what I believe in. Because there are people around you, sir, madam, that are depending on what you say. And that's why I want you to pray for me. It's so important that I tell you the truth. Now, if we look at the Word of God in uh, John chapter 17 and verse 17, I'm going to read it to you because I want you to get it exactly right. John chapter 17 and verse 17. Yes, I'm speaking about the Word of God. Not Angus Buchan's Word, not the Pope's Word, not the Archbishop's Word, not uh, some big uh, Christian leader's Word. No, the Word of God. And this is what the Word of God says in John chapter 17 and verse 17. We're just about there. Okay, this is what it says. John 17, 17. Sanctify them. means set them apart. Sanctify them by your truth. That's what Jesus says. Your word is truth. In the beginning was the, that's right, the word. And the word was with God and the word was God. There is no authority on earth that can uh, in any way water down or diminish the power of the word of God. Jesus says, I put my word above my name. Okay? Because he is the word. See? If you look at 1 John 1, 9, it, it, it talks about the word. The disciples, John says, we've touched him. We've, we've heard him. We've seen him. The word. Now, friends, when you get some preacher, and it might even be me, God forbid, that starts to tell you that they've got a new revelation of something that's not in the word, I want you to take your cricket bat and hit it for six because it deserves to be. John said, you add anything to this book, you take anything away from this book, every plague in this book will come upon you. It's a very dangerous thing to start thinking that you are God. There's nobody on this earth, on the planet, who has got the authority to change the word. If a man says to you, no, no, the word must change because we're all evolving. No. Before there was a world, before there was a universe, there was the word. And the word is truth. Now, I've never been to a seminary. I've never been to university. I don't have a degree in theology. Neither does Snowy. <laughs> but I want to tell you something now. Snowy knows that there's green grass out there. And as soon as I let him out, he's going to go and eat it. He doesn't have to be told that. And I want to tell you, I'm a farmer. When I wake up in the morning, I see the sun rising. I know there's a God. And when I can feel that breeze on my face, and I see the swallows coming down from the northern hemisphere, and no one showed them the way, and they come back to the same country, the same province, the same town, the same street, and the same house. And they have their babies there, then they fly back again. Who told them about that? Well, I'll leave it up to your own discretion. It definitely wasn't a big bang. <laughs> and it wasn't somebody's opinion. It was the Word. And His name is Jesus Christ. 
and he's the son of God. I haven't been to a seminary, but folks, I know that my Redeemer lives. That's what Job said. And Job said, even though he slay me, yet will I still trust him. How's that for faith? Job chapter 13 and verse 15. I want to tell you that as I'm getting older, and I am getting older, <laughs> and I'm quite happy about that, I want to tell you that I am more certain that this is the undiluted, uncompromised Word of God than I've ever thought about it before, from the time I was saved. And by the way, this year I will be 35 years old in the Lord. Now, I know some of you are watching the, the TV and you're saying, about, I'm 60 years old in the Lord. Well, bless you and well done. But I want to tell you, in 35 years, He has never disappointed me. He has never failed me. He has, I have never proved Him to be untrue. In 35 years, folks, I know that this is the Word. Do not allow anyone, I said, anyone, to pull the wool over your eyes and tell you that all roads lead to heaven. Why? Because the Word says it's not true. John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus says, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life, and no one is going to the Father but by me. Folks, that's pretty straightforward. Now, some of you are sitting there and saying, well, that's counter, that, 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 that's, um, that's hate speech, Angus. No, it's not. It's not. If you love somebody, you tell them the truth. And that's what Jesus did. That's why they crucified him. Because he said to them, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. So what was he saying? I am God. And that's why they killed him. And who killed him? The Romans? No, the Romans didn't kill him. The church killed him. Oh, yes, the church as it was in those days. The church killed him. The people who were desperately waiting for the Messiah. The Messiah came. He stood in, a, in their midst and they didn't recognize him. How many times has that happened in your life? If you go up to the north of Scotland, to the west coast, to the Hebrides, the Isle of Harris, Lewis, right up to the Shetland Islands, they had a revival there in the 1950s. The evangelical church had been praying for revival for years. I'm talking about small communities, not a big place. And God chose to bring the revival through the mainline church. And what happened? They were still praying for the revival when the revival had come and gone. You see how easy it is to miss it. Be careful, folks. That's the biggest problem we have, the heart of unbelief. Now, the only way that you can be sure is to know the Word of God. You need to get it into your heart. I want to encourage every one of you watching this program. It's more important than working in soup kitchens. I'm telling you. Jesus said, you'll always have your, the poor with you, but you won't always have me with you. We run a children's home on this place. I'm not bragging. We support the poor and the hungry and the needy. I'm no respecter of persons. I'll preach wherever I've been invited. This coming week, I'm going to one of the wealthiest churches in South Africa. And I'll get hammered for that. The next week, I'll be preaching down in the thorns underneath a tree. I'll get hammered for that too. I go where Jesus tells me to go. The Lord spoke to the rich man. Zacchaeus was an incredibly rich man. And he was a thief. And he invited all his fellow friends and they all got saved that day. Right? The woman by the well. You and I would never speak to a woman like that. She was a prostitute. Jesus sat there and he told her her whole life story. She went back into the village and the whole village was converted. Jesus is no respect of persons and neither am I. I want to tell you something today. Do not minimize the word. I want to ask you to do something, especially for me. I'm sure you do that anyway. You take your Bible when I'm preaching and you put it on your lap. And when I start telling stories and I start making statements, check it out with the word. If I'm saying something that is ungodly, please write to me and tell me and I will repent. Some of you have done that, by the way, in the past. You've, you, you've written to me and you've given me opinions. I'm not interested in your opinion, by the way, so don't waste the paper. <laughs> okay? And you shouldn't be interested in my opinion. Okay? We're interested in God's opinion. So if you've got a problem with the Word of God, you write to me and you tell me. And if I've said something out of context, I will be the first to repent because I also want to learn. But folks, also be humble enough to realize that if God shows you something through this old farmer, then receive it. 
So I don't care on whose authority you write to me. Unless it's on the word of God, I don't want to know about it. I won't even read the letter, okay? But if you can quote a scripture and show me where I am wrong, I will be the first one to say sorry, okay? We need to start to understand one thing. In these last days, what's going to happen? The word of God is being attacked. The word of God is being watered down. The word of God is being taken apart. Why? Because this is the thing the devil hates the most. And this is where the power is. See, when you say, thus says the Lord, then there's power. That's what they said about Billy Graham. Why he was so successful, he would say, and the word of God says, unless a man is born again, he will never see the kingdom of heaven. Then he makes the altar call and the whole stadium comes to the front. Why? Because the word of God has got power. When you start saying, well, you know, in my opinion, you need to give your lives to the Lord. Nobody's going to move. I know that. You notice I don't tell as many stories nowadays as I did when I started preaching. Why? Because they've got no power. This is the word that's got power. Our oh, folks, I love this word. As I'm getting older, I'm realizing I don't want to waste my time. Set them apart by your truth. Your word is truth. Snow is even not in, in agreement here. Come on. <laughs> folks, I want to say something to you. You want to get somebody really upset? You read the word. I don't have to be controversial. I don't have to make myself popular or unpopular. The word does that. Okay, not all people are going to agree with you. I can tell you now. Every time the Apostle Paul, who in my opinion was the greatest evangelist in this book, the whole 66 of them, next to the master, every time he went to a town, it was his habit, because he was a godly man, he was a member of the Sanhedrin, he was an Orthodox Jew, he knew exactly what he had to do. Where was the first place he went to? The first place he went to was Straight to the synagogue. And what happened in the synagogue? He got a hiding. He got a thrashing. He was nearly killed every single time. They pulled him out, tied him to the stake, and lashed him. 39 lashes. Why not 40, Angus? 40 is the death penalty. That's how much they thrashed him. And yet you go to the next town. Where would he go? To the synagogue. First to the people of uh, Israel. And then to the Gentiles. I want to suggest to you that it's the Word of God that will make you unpopular. But it's the Word of God that will give you power. You see, you see, Bartimaeus was a blind man. He was sitting by the roadside, and you can read it in the Word. And he heard that Jesus was coming past. And he knew he only had one chance. And so he cried out, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. And the crowd told him to shut up. And the crowd often tell me to shut up. And then I speak even louder. And Jesus stopped in the road and he turned around and he said, who's calling my name? Then the crowd turned around. I've seen that too. Oh, Bartimaeus, the Lord's calling you. And they led the blind man to Jesus. And he stood there in front of Jesus, blind, stone blind. Okay, that's what the word says. And Jesus asked him a strange question. Bartimaeus, what do you want me to do for you? Well, I'm going to ask, you asking me a question as you're sitting in that house. I can hear you. Angus, what do you want us to do? I want you to start to read the word of God in the first person. What does that mean? Put your name there. And Angus, what do you want me to do for you? Lord, that I might receive my sight. Lord, that you might give me, give me understanding of your word. Lord, that you might direct my paths. I don't have any time left, Lord, to take any more cul-de-sacs. It takes too much time to get to the bottom of the road, turn around and come back up again. I want the word. I want it straight and I want it in power. And so Bartimaeus said, Rabboni, which means teacher, that I might receive my sight. He was talking about physical sight. I'm talking about spiritual sight, which is even more important. And Jesus said, be healed. And he said, your faith, Bartimaeus has made you well. Faith in what? In the word. How do you spell word? J-E-S-U-S. -S. That's how you spell the word. This is the word. So you want, somebody says to you, a friend of yours says, this Jesus you're always talking to us about. 
show him to me. Can you show him? He said, yeah, I can. Go and buy them a Bible. Give it to them. Say, this is Jesus in print. Now, when I stress something like that, I can see now you're starting to sit up and take notice. How can you start to undress and take away from the power of God? Well, we don't do that, Angus. Every time you compromise the word, that's exactly what you're doing. Every time you say, well, you know, not all these stories in this Bible are true. Some of them are old fables, and some of them are, you know, were for that time, not for now. As soon as you've done that, you've taken away the power and the effectiveness, and that's why there's no power in your life, my friend, because you're now minimizing the Word of God. You see, Bartimaeus knew before he got up that if that man lays his hands upon me, I'm going to be healed. He knew it. That's why he was healed. If he got up there and said, look, I'm not too sure whether this is the Son of God. Maybe he's just a good man and God came to live inside him. No healing. Bartimaeus, your faith has made you well. What about the woman with the issue of blood? She's been bleeding for 12 years. She'd taken all her money, spent it on doctor's bills, and she was still dying. She had one more chance. She saw the master walking past. She pushed through the crowd. She got underneath there and she grabbed his, the, his garment. If I can just touch the hem of his garment, she's saying to herself, I know I'll be healed. She pushed through all the people. There was a crowd pushing the Lord, one side, this side. He was on his way to Jairus' daughter who was already dead. Touched the hem of his garment. The master stopped and he turned. Somebody had taken the word, literally. Who touched me? Come on, Lord, that Peter must have said. It would have been Peter. <laughs> He's the big mouth. Come on, Lord, the people are pushing you all over. No, 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 no. Somebody has just touched me. This woman embarrassed. By that time, of course, she'd completely dried up. There was no blood, nothing. She knew that. It was me. Woman, go in peace. Your faith has made you well. Why? Because she said, if I can just touch the hem of his garment. Not, well, I hope so. Um, I've got nothing else to lose. So what the heck? Let's just give it a chance. Folks, when you read this word, you must read it with reverence. I want to tell you a story I'll never forget. It humbled me. As a new believer, I went into a Muslim's house. I say, he invited me in, a very humble man. I sat down there with my Bible. He had a beautiful carpet. It was a low chair. I took my Bible and I put it on the carpet. He was offering me a cup of tea. He stopped in his tracks. He said, sir, don't put that book on the floor, please. Give it to me. And he put my Bible on a table. That came from a Muslim. This business of standing on the word. We've been through all that and proclaiming the word. Folks, I want to tell you, that's no good. You don't stand on the word. When you hear in countries where the Bible is not allowed, places like North Korea, where they'll take a Bible and they'll dissect it page by page, and they'll circulate one page to each member of the congregation and come back next Sunday and change the pages. That's how much they, they love this word. And you stand on top of it. Be careful. I want to say to you, moms and dads, you, if you've got children that uh, disrespect this word, I'm talking about the book. Yes, the book. Oh, Angus, it's just a book. No, it's not just a book. It's life. You must teach them to respect the word of God. You must teach them to believe it from Genesis through to Revelation. You must tell them that this is the word written by a man, by men, anointed men, by the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. Every word in this book has come true so far. And I know every time I read the word, it happened to me in Gedi in 2012, September, the lowest point on earth. I read the account of the visitation of the Holy Spirit in the upper room 2,000 years ago. And when I closed my Bible, I said, Jesus, please do it again. And some of you are watching this program right now, and you were there. And a rushing mighty wind came and nearly blew me off the platform and all the equipment, and the side screens were shattered, and it started raining. <laughs> and it never rains there. Why? Because we read the Word of God. If your children are sick, take the Word of God and read it over them. God said, if any of you are sick, right, call the elders, anoint the sick with oil, pray the prayer of faith, and God will raise him up. Do it. Do it. God is not a man that he should lie. 
nor the Son of Man that he should repent. Has he not said it? Will he not do it? Has he not spoken and will he not make it good? He doesn't tell lies. Now, as soon as you start to compromise this word, what are you going to use as your compass? Where do you start from? Well, well, we use some of the Bible. You can't use some of the Bible. It's either all or nothing. It's either 100% or no percent. I'm suggesting to you, do what Billy Graham did. Go take this Bible, put it on that stump in the middle of that forest or wherever on your bed and say, Jesus, I don't understand everything in this book. But I'm choosing to believe that it is ordained of you. And then go out and see what happens. I don't know of a more famous, successful evangelist that's ever lived than Dr. Billy Graham. A dairy farmer's son, by the way. Right? And he'll tell you he's not the best preacher by any means. But I'll tell you what, he's impacted more lives than any others. Why? Because he uses the word. And you'll never hear him saying, well, it's not exactly like that. And that was just a, like a fable, an old wife's tale to illustrate something. You'll never hear him say that. And that's why there's power in his preaching. I pray for the sick folks. I believe in signs and wonders and miracles. It's the tools of the trade of an evangelist. And I want to tell you something now. I've seen things that only God could have done. And you know how it's worked? That's right. Quoting the Word of God. Let's take one quote as I close. Mark eleven twenty four. Whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you shall receive them and you'll have them. How do you believe? Well, the Bible says, Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word. Now, if you don't believe the Word, you've got no faith. If you've got no faith, <laughs> you're insipid. And I'm telling you, the, the devil will chew you up and spit you out in pieces. Folks, please, I, I beg you. I plead with you because I've seen it too much on the news lately. Too many icons in this world taking the Word of God and dissecting it. You can't do that. Father, I pray for every one of my friends because these are my friends that are watching this program. Lord, don't allow. Please, I come against it. Any unbelief, any doubt, any disagreement with this book, Lord, teach them that this is their lifeline to eternal life. Teach them that this is the, the, the book that will guide them in every decision they need to make. I ask this in your precious name. Amen. Well, God bless you. And I want to say to you folks from the bottom of my heart, I love you very much. And that's the only reason why I tell you the truth. The truth will set you free. John 17, 17. Sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. Until next time, God bless you. Goodbye. This could be my we trust that you were blessed by today's program. To find out more about Family Time with Angus Bucken, Grassroots or upcoming events, please go to angusbucken.com.